summer of 2005, Johan Otter tried to save his daughter from the jaws of an angry grizzly while hiking in Montana. It really felt like I was trying to rip my head off. And I remember thinking, okay, one more bite and I'm done. Glacier National Park, one of America's last great wilderness areas. It's home to the nation's most feared predator, the grizzly bear. Every year, grizzlies claim the lives of people who get too close. Johan Otter and his daughter Jenna are here for a hiking yeah, vacation. This one right here. Right here. Yep. Right. To celebrate her graduation. Ready to go. All right. And it's kind of cool that your daughter still wants to go on a senior trip, you know, and with dad to go into the mountains. But today's ambitious hike will test them in more ways than they can possibly imagine. <laughs> Survival in this wilderness is brutal. This female grizzly is dangerous. She has two cubs and will attack anything that comes near them. Dr. Barry Gilbert knows just how deadly these bears can be. He himself was badly mauled by a grizzly. Grizzly bears have the smallest young of any of the mammals. They can weigh two or three pounds when they're young, so they're really vulnerable. This is what has caused the female to evolve into being suicidally aggressive. She lays out her all for those cubs. It's too early for other hikers to be on the trail. I sort of had this underlying nervousness in the morning and the evening hours are the prime feeding times for animals so that's when they're going to be out and about a lot more oh, I, gotta take a, I gotta take a video of this it's beautiful wow. good dad we've got a long way to go let's keep going uh -huh. but johan and jenna are seasoned hikers the precaution i knew when hiking was just to make noise we knew to not be too quiet, although we didn't know how loud to actually be. We talked continuously during that time, and we made sure we looked around as much as possible. So your mom wanted me to have a talk with you about keeping to your studies. They also carry a can of bear spray. This is their only defense against a predator attack. I don't. We didn't have it on our belt, it was just in the backpack. You know, really thinking that you're not going to be able to have to use that. It's not going to happen to you. They climb higher and further away from human habitation. If anything should happen to them, Johan and Jenna are on their own. Grizzlies normally steer clear of people they can pick up a scent from over two miles away. But the wind is blowing down the mountain, away from the bear. And that would just negate the bear's best warning system, which is its nose, its sense of smell. And that's almost a perfect storm scenario. The grizzly is now on a deadly collision course. A surprised bear is an angry bear, and an angry bear is an aggressive bear and a dangerous bear. So do you honestly think that you're going to be able to keep up with, you know, practice and dance? Wow. Look at this. High above the lake, the view is spectacular. Wow. Johan and Jenna fall silent, a mistake that could cost their lives. There's a bend in the trail, so you can't see around it, but you don't expect anything to be around it, um, which I guess is a, a bad assumption to make.
front of me is a mother grizzly bear followed by two cubs right behind her. I thought like I'm going to die. If you turn and run, you've immediately put a hamburger sign across your back. To save his daughter, Johan puts his own life on the line. And it's something instinctual. It's not something you actually think about. It basically went into my thigh. The bear bites deep into Johan's leg again and again, right down to the bone. It wasn't like it was holding on to my leg and just kind of being in there. No, it was kind of in out type of thing. If he wants to live, Johan has to break loose. But there's only one way out, down. I decided to jump off the trail. It was about 20, 25 feet into some bushes. My eye was already bleeding or something like that at that point. So something must have gotten into my face. Because the animal went at me like this. So it must have been one of the claws. can of bear spray that my dad had in the side pocket of his backpack. I pick up the can, but I didn't know how to work the can. And you can't really stop and read instructions at that point. Out of time and options, Jenna leaps into the unknown. Johan as no idea his daughter has jumped. Jenna, down here! And I see the bear cocks its head back again, looks down at me. By being active, she might have interpreted that he was doing a circle around to get at the cubs. Hell bent on finishing them off. The bear charges down the mountain. Never felt or seen anything as strong and fast in my life. There's one big piece of muscle. It was lifting me up nearly out of the bushes. Bears will sometimes try to flip people over to get at their face when they're going after people. It was like, I need to keep this animal with me, you know, away from Jenna, basically. Next thing I remember, falling around a good steep fall, say 30 feet or something. Johan's luck holds. He's cheated death once more. But by chance, Johan has landed on the same ledge as Jenna. And then when I landed down, and here's that bear, it's still, you know, with me. Trying to protect his daughter, Johan has brought the angry grizzly straight to her. Now the bear moves in for the kill. <laughs> Johan Otter and his daughter Jenna have escaped a savage grizzly by throwing themselves off a mountain. Hot on their trail, the bear is going in for the kill. The animal just wants to get rid of you, to neutralize you, to make you no threat to her cubs. Jenna tries to hide, but Johan faces the predator head on. But I just wanted to make sure it was, you know, away from Jenna. Johan grabs for the nearest weapon but it turns to dust. And I still remember those two eyes, amber brown, looking straight into my eyes. No feelings. Looking there straight in the eye and continuing to look at them is uh, generally aggressive. And it really started chomping down on my arm. It was just ripping it apart. We don't have 
the physical structure to stand up to even a, a friendly wrestling match with a bear, let alone when they're ticked off and a mom is feeling defensive about her cubs. You have this helpless feeling of, I can't do anything, but you want to help, but you can't do anything. The bear goes for the killer bite to his head. Is it's going after a person just like it would another bear. They're aiming for the mouth and the face because they're trying to disable their opponent's weapons. That's their teeth, that's their jaws. The grizzly's canines are about two inches long, made for gripping and tearing. The molars are flat for crushing and grinding. It really felt like we're trying to rip my head up. And the tooth really went into my skull. I could feel this bone cracking. And I remember thinking, okay, one more bite and I'm done. And then I looked down and I'm like, oh, one more fall and I'm dead. But I also knew that if I would stay there, I would be dead. Determined not to die, Johan breaks free and leaps into the void once again. A small rocky ledge saves him from certain death, 1,400 feet below. And then I looked up, and I, the bear kind of was looking over the ledge, basically. I, I couldn't get to me. It was too steep, basically. But the grizzly isn't done yet. It can still smell human flesh. It was just fear of being found, which you know is inevitable. I heard the bear breathing. And it's sort of like that stomach churning, like, oh no, kind of feeling. <laughs> and I must have screamed. China. Worst sound in the world. You've tried to keep this animal with you as long as possible to keep it away from your daughter, and, and still. Jenna is trapped. Its lower jaw was the one that ripped open my mouth, and the upper one was the one that grabbed on my neck. And my whole head was in its mouth. OK, I'm dead. Let's get it over with. This could be the end of the line for Jenna. Johan Otter has escaped a savage grizzly attack by jumping off a mountain. The bear has now turned on his 18-year-old daughter. Face to face with death, Jenna takes a huge gamble. I just tried to be as still as possible so that it would think that I was dead. The playing dead routine works if you can quit moving and if you can remain as silent as possible. That tells the bear, OK, this person is no longer a threat. You can leave. Jenna keeps completely still and silent. Johan has no idea what is happening. I don't hear anything anymore. 
I mean, it could mean one or two things. One, the animal left my daughter alone, or two, she's dead. Johan doesn't dare make a sound. If the bear has gone, any noise might bring it back. He waits two agonizing minutes, then decides to take a chance. Jenna. That's probably the best feeling. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's still... It's still a little emotional. Are you okay? I'm okay. Her voice was very strong. Sounded very healthy. Oh. Oh, I think I banged up pretty bad. And I was going for my head, and then all I feel was just bone, 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 bone. Like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to feel anymore. That's not good. It's still too early for many hikers to be this far up the trail. <laughs> Johan uses his nylon jacket to protect his exposed scalp. He needs urgent medical attention. Adrenaline triggered by the attack is draining away. He is going into shock. I was getting a little woozy. I was just shaking. I was so cold. Johan and Jenna's cries are finally heard by other hikers. Two hours later, they're airlifted to the hospital. Johan's spine and neck are broken. His scalp needs a skin graft. He has three broken ribs, a broken nose, and a punctured eye. It takes nine operations and many months for Johan to recover. Jenna also requires surgery and begins university wrapped in bandages. Yeah, you kind of feel guilty in a way, you know, because you've taken your daughter into a dangerous area. Shouldn't have done that. That's when you get a little emotional, like, you know, shoot, I'm doing this to all these people. <laughs> because folks didn't, didn't care. They were happy I was still alive. So. After the attack, experts agree the bear was acting naturally, trying to defend her cubs. They thought she posed no further danger to people, so she was not put down. <laughs> For thousands of years, bears were America's supreme predators. From Alaska to Mexico, they were top of the food chain. Native Americans were in awe of their ferocious temper and huge strength. Some tribes worshipped bears. They wore their skin and claws as symbols of power. But killing a bear meant hunting in groups increased the chance of coming back alive. European settlers, however, were far less cautious. They saw bears as a dangerous pest that preyed on their livestock. Convinced their guns would protect them, they set out to kill as many as possible. And this was the age of the homesteader. And for those people, if they lost a cow, if they lost a couple sheep, you know, it, it was a huge cost for them. In the mid-1800s, prospectors pushed deeper into bear country, looking for gold. Scavenging bears soon learned that where there were people, there were food scraps. Very occasionally, Bears also developed a taste for human flesh. Today, there are still freak incidents when bears see humans as prey. In the summer of 1997, Kelly McConnell's life was shattered 
when a black bear went on one of North America's most horrific bear rampages. It was just trying to eat me. Liard River Hot Springs, British Columbia, a popular place to relax and unwind. It's home to many black bears who feed on food scraps that people leave behind. In rare cases, they can take that terrible next step. It's bears that have been both habituated to people and then food condition that have injured or preyed on people. Like other bears in the park, this male feeds on human leftovers as well as plants and insects and the occasional young animal. An opportunistic predator is almost always hungry, a potentially dangerous situation. Where are we going to go back to Paris? Where are we going to go back to Paris? Thirteen-year-old Kelly McConnell and his mother, Patty, are moving from Texas to Alaska to start a new life. They're breaking the long trip with a well-earned rest. Oh, that's hard. We're just gonna relax after a long day of driving. Uh, uh, we just wanted to go to the hot springs itself and, and relax. Even though they know there are bears in the area, Kelly and his mother decide to explore the park. And I actually did comment at that time, I wish that I could see one. And my mother corrected me and told me that I did not wish I would see one. But Kelly and his mother have no idea of the danger they're in. It's so rare. The bear can smell prey, and it's closing in on them. A predaceous attack, by and large, is a slow approach toward you, constant following of you, if you like, waiting for its tactical advantage to come in and, and get on you. Come on, let's go. Kelly, come on. Patty and Kelly have walked into a death trap. Frozen with fear, she has no idea what to do. Kelly. Hi, Mom. There's a bear. Yeah, right. I didn't believe what she was saying. She's always fooling around. I couldn't, I didn't know what to believe. Kelly. Kelly. But it's no joke. <laughs> Don't move. If it's not making any noise, if it's not making a commotion, and it starts coming at you, this bear's in a predatory mode, and you've got to start thinking about what can I do to defend myself. The 400-pound beast viciously attacks Patty. Both she and Kelly are staring death in the face. This bear could rip them apart in seconds. In a nature park in British Columbia, 13-year-old Kelly McConnell has put his life on the line to save his mother from the jaws of a bear. And I was screaming for help, and there was no one around. I felt so helpless. A bloodthirsty beast tears into Patty. It was trying to eat my mother. Bears don't always kill completely kill their prey before eating it. They'll just start eating. And they do that with big game animals, and it's, it's pretty well known that they do it with people, too. Kelly desperately tries to save his mother. But then, 
In a heartbeat, the bear turns on him. I can just remember thinking I hope that I saved my mother's life, but, but I remember thinking it was all a nightmare. Kelly has become the beast's next meal. The bear locks its powerful jaws around his waist and lifts him off the ground. I could feel the, the bones crunching in my body like... I was pretty sure I was gonna die. Kelly's about to pass out, but suddenly the animal drops him. He falls on his front, keeping his vital organs safe from the bear's teeth and claws. They just began mauling me from the backside. It would just bite into my back and just tear tear my skin. It was it was eating me. Kelly and his mom are so far from the hot springs, there's a danger no one will hear their screams. But one man does. Ray Kitchen, a truck driver, races to the scene and heroically takes on the man-eater himself. This is an animal that's obsessively hungry, if not starving to death. And it may see other people that interfere as trying to take the carcass away from them. The bear's reaction is explosive. It turns on Kitchen and begins to eat him alive. Bears sometimes go into what they call surplus killing. They get into a herd of sheep, and it's so easy to kill them, they just knock them over left and right way more than they're ever going to be able to eat them. Kelly is too badly wounded to do anything to help. Kitchen is pinned beneath the raging animal. He can do nothing to stop it ripping him to pieces. Tony Dowk, a trucker from Alberta, hears Kitchen screaming and comes to help. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The bear was on Ray Kitchen, mauling him to death. And it stared at me. I was looking at it straight in the eyes. And I hit him dead square in the eyes. claws come up and just miss me because I jumped back. Tony is lucky the bear doesn't go after him. Instead, it finally kills Ray Kitchen. I heard Ray scream his last few, or try to scream, you know, the last few thought or sounds that his voice could make. And, uh, I screamed, oh my God, oh my God, and that was it. Ray's throat has been ripped open. They're getting the neck because they're going for the windpipe and for the vertebrae. <laughs> Kelly's wounds are so bad, he can't move. Patty is alive, but very weak. She told me that I should take care of my sisters. And, um, and then she told me she loved me. Patty loses consciousness. Other people are drawn by the shouts. They desperately try to keep the furious bear away from Kelly and his mom. Paramedic Ingrid Bailey joins the frantic rescue effort. 
Mr. Kitchen was just flat out on the ground, missing a big chunk of his neck. And at that point, I stopped trying to do anything for Mr. Kitchen and uh, went over and aided the other two folks who had already been attacked. Ingrid does what she can, even though she could be next. The bear is only a few feet away. It could strike at any moment. The only way to end the carnage is by killing the bear. Keep putting pressure on that But this vicious predator is not done yet with its bloody rampage. It has the taste for human flesh and wants more. Black Bear has savagely attacked Patty and Kelly McConnell and killed the man who tried to help them. Now the bloodthirsty bear is on the rampage and heading towards the hot springs. There's panic. But running bodies trigger the bear's killer instinct. The attraction of moving prey is overrides the feeding. They'll feed later. The massacre won't end until someone kills the crazed beast. Ingrid Bailey is still trying to revive Patty when the bear attacks another victim. He caught up with a group of college students and the last student in line slipped on the boardwalk, which was a little damp from a light rain, and the bear caught up with that person and mauled him as well. Finally, someone arrives with a gun. The bear is shot dead. Lots of pressure, he's losing a lot of blood. But it's too late for Patty McConnell. She dies of her horrific injuries. Her 13-year-old son, Kelly, just manages to pull through. Both my lungs were punctured. They said there was over 100 centimeters of stitches. I had suffered a few broken ribs. Three of my vertebrae were broken. An attack like this is very rare. Two people are dead and two seriously injured. But incredibly, Kelly doesn't hate the animal that took his mother's life. I feel like the bear, it didn't try to do anything that wasn't normal for it to do. I mean, normally bears don't attack people and, um, and then probably had no choice but to attack or else die from starvation itself. The horrific events at Liard Park show just how helpless we are when these predators turn on us. Without a gun, the death toll could have been much higher. Killing a bear in full attack mode is difficult, even with modern weapons. Back in the 1800s, it was much harder. As Michigan hunter and trapper Franklin Devereaux found out in 1883 when he tried to shoot a grizzly. In the time it took to reload his gun, the enraged bear charged and killed him. Placing a headshot, unless the bear is immobile, is just about impossible. A skull is very hard to hammer, you'd have trouble breaking it. In those days, bears were often only injured, and a wounded bear is extremely dangerous stop at nothing to kill its attacker. The invention of the repeating rifle finally gave man the upper hand. When we went from single-shot muskets to lever-action repeating rifles, 
That was a huge blow to grizzly bears. And it was both a combination of firepower, how fast you could shoot, and also the power of the weapon. Hunting bears became a popular sport. They were killed in the thousands. Grizzly bear numbers plummeted, and today they are protected by law. But as more hunters and hikers venture into the last remaining wilderness, violent encounters still happen. And when an angry bear attacks, even a modern weapon may not save you. In the summer of 2001, Pastor Johnny McCoy found a gun wasn't enough to protect him from a furious grizzly determined to see him dead. And she was literally just trying to break my skull. Pastor Johnny McCoy and church deacon Gary Coro are old friends who've been hunting together for years. They're on a two-week hunting trip in the Alaskan wilderness. We was going moose hunting to have the meat for the winter, or for the following year. That's what we eat. That's the food for the family. They are well aware of the dangers lurking in the woods. While tracking their prey, they soon notice signs of grizzlies. It makes me absolutely nervous walking through the woods, knowing that there are bear there, knowing that we are in their territory. This scat belongs to a female grizzly. She has cubs nearby. McCoy and Coral trek further into the bear's territory. Unlike hikers, they make as little noise as possible. Hunters are probably more prone to bump into bears than other people because they're moving quietly. McCoy takes a break. Coral presses on. Alone, he's much more likely to be attacked. <laughs> Coral is walking quietly. The grizzly won't see or hear him until it's too late. It was probably just out there with its cubs. All of a sudden, here's these people. So to Ma Grizzly, you see that as a threat. McCoy, meanwhile, hurries to catch up with Coral. Suddenly, something tears out of the trees. It's racing towards Coral. She ran right out within 10 feet in front of me. In my mind, I said, it's a bear. McCoy can't shoot. He could hit Coral. By the time his friend hears a grizzly, it's too late. And as I turned my head and looked around, all I could see was the mouth of a bear, and it was wide open. <laughs> I just thought that the bear's gonna kill me. Today I'm gonna go be with the Lord. At first, Coral's backpack shields him from the deadly claws. The bear was just trying to get the pack out of the way to get it done. I'm thinking my buddy is, you know, my best friend's gonna be killed. So I'm saying, God, what do I do? But Coral doesn't panic. Incredibly, he pulls his gun out from under him and points it blindly over his shoulder. It wasn't an easy thing to do. I squashed the trigger and boom. It was instant relief. A second later, 
Coral hears a terrifying scream. Church deacon Gary Coral has been attacked by a grizzly. He shot the bear, making it let go. Now the enraged beast turns on Coral's hunting buddy, Johnny McCoy. When bears are injured during an attack, it seems that pain is a stimulus to attack harder. McCoy reacts with lightning speed. And I just took my gun, I thought, oh my goodness, and shoved it in her mouth. The grizzly bites down. When I shoved that gun in her mouth and pulled the trigger, there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. And then she just swatted it out of the way. The grizzly leaps on McCoy with a vengeance, biting deep into his arm and shoulder. And I've never heard any more agonizing screams of horror than the screams that I heard him put. first thing that she did was to, um, to bite and break my arms in nine places. A grizzly's jaws can exert over 750 pounds of force. It's like being hit by a sledgehammer. Coral can't shoot in case he hits McCoy. He can only watch as the bear tears his friend apart. I could hear the bones crunching. I could actually hear them break. I, I seem to even be able to hear the flesh being ripped off of these bones. McCoy can't fight anymore. His arms are badly mauled. The grizzly now lunges for his head, the death blow. And all I could smell was her breath. It was the most awful stench I've ever smelled in my life. And I thought, okay, you know, God, this is it. You know, Lord, I'm ready. This is it. And I just quit. I, I just quit. McCoy's body goes limp. And the bear turned around and looked at me. Suddenly, the bear runs off. I think in about one second, he must have covered 100 yards. He was clear out of sight. I never fired a shot. It was so quick. McCoy is in bad shape. I'd already resigned the fact that I was not going to make it. I could have bled to death. Johnny, John. Both his arms are badly injured. His scalp is shredded. His ear is torn off. One eye hangs from its socket. Talk to him. Talk to him. Coral must act quickly to save his friend. Well, we had lots of game sacks. So I took the game sacks and put his scalp back on as good as I could and put his eyeball back in his head and stuffed his ear up in there and tied the game sacks on him. And when I got done, I looked at him and I thought, oh my, I thought, how am I ever gonna get him to stand up? McCoy can't see anything, and they've left their cell phone back at the camp. It takes the injured hunters three hours to get there. Eventually, they are airlifted to the hospital. Emotionally, I'm still dealing with that. It, it's tough. <laughs> If I'm under a lot of stress, uh, my wife has to wake me up because I, you know, I'm, I'm fighting with a bear all over again. Hey! 
I woke up a few times at night thinking about this bear on my back. With the bear tearing him apart, and the bones crunching, sure, you don't ever forget that. The grizzly bear was later found dead of the single gunshot wound. Thousands of people encounter bears every year, but attacks are unusual. It's most likely one of two causes. One, it's a predatory incident, and that happens with both black bears and grizzly bears. And then the second thing, is defense of personal space. When bears do strike, it can have a profound and lasting effect on those who are lucky enough to survive. In the blink of an instance, your life can completely be changed without you having any say in what happens. So you should just go out and live every day like it's your last day, because it might be, you just never know. I will never, ever be the same again in a tremendous way. I don't take the wildlife for granted. I don't take grizzly bears for granted anymore.